It's time for the Spoonie One Wrestling Show. It's time for the Spoonie One Wrestling Show. Welcome to Wrestle Wrestle. We got two episodes coming for you today. Um, I've been putting off the whole effing show because I've been busy with other stuff in my life. But I finally got around to watching it, and I got around to watching SummerSlam. And uh, I guess the first thing I'd like to bring up is, once again, this whole thing with the whole effing show ties into Hardcore Justice. And you saw this thing. I'm getting a lot of heat, actually. A lot of heat. For not liking Hardcore Justice. In fact, some people whose opinions I really respect are getting on me for, for really ragging on this. For calling it trash wrestling. For not having fun, um, people have been calling me out saying, like, the FBI have never been about, not really ever been about wrestling, they've always been kind of the goofy dancing assholes. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Am I way off base here? I mean, I know you're likely to agree with me because you're my brother, but, like, you, maybe not, I, I don't know. I just found it depressing. I mean, it, it, it that's the worst thing to say about a wrestling show is that it's depressing, but you see... It, it, it kind of reminds me of the wrestler, and it shouldn't. You know, the these the old, very sad the story. Very, the very sad story of Mickey Rourke. Uh, you know, these people that that can't seem to move on with their lives and keep have to keep coming back to this, to because they're they're like addicted to it. I mean, it, the the one thing I, I keep bringing up is Tommy Dreamer bleeding in front of his kids, and how that reminded everyone of Beyond the Mat, of how mm. Mick Foley. Just almost traumatized his kids when Rock was wailing on him on a chair, yeah. and and it, I just can't believe what he Tommy would do to his kids with that, and just seeing all these people that that can't move on, except like Francine, who's like the one person who who can seemingly move yeah. on and have a normal life. I, I think what people were getting <laughs> on me about was. They, 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 they called into question whether or not I really knew what hardcore wrestling was. Like, whether or not I was remembering it wrong, or if I'm just plain wrong when it comes to the fact, like, look, hardcore wrestling has always been about the goofy dancing spots. It's always been about these matches where two guys just hit each other sloppily in the head with heavy steel objects until one guy just falls down. It's never really been about the elite technical wrestling and stuff like that. I mean, it, it had its place in ECW, but the real feature was just the blood and guts garbage wrestling. And I don't know if that's true. And even if that is true, I don't know that... Like, just watching the show, I don't remember it being this goofy. I don't remember it being this much played for laughs. I don't remember the Dudley boys having these lame-ass lightsaber battles with Balls Mahoney in the middle of the ring. You know, at least when these guys were garbage wrestling, they were beating the shit out of each other. I mean, legitimately, just pulverizing one another. And if you wanted to see a blood sport, like if you wanted to see blood and guts wrestling, at least ECW delivered that. I'm not saying it was good wrestling by any means, but it was better than this, because those guys could still go. These guys in Hardcore Justice were 20, 25 years past their prime. Old, slow, beat up, couldn't go anymore, and half those guys should have had no business even setting foot in a wrestling ring ever again. Axel Rotten. Even the Dudley Boys should probably have hung it up like five years ago. Well, I'm even using One Night Stand as a kind of uh, point to examine. And even then, you look at the hardcore there, and it's it's great, even. You see Mike Awesome putting people through chairs and powerbombing people through... That was... And, and it's ridiculous stunts. I mean, that that's where the where you kind of sit in amazement as watching these people put their bodies through such physical torment. Mike Awesome is probably one of the ultimate and most tragic examples of the results of hardcore wrestling, by the way. And the, man, you, the man's dead. You would see <laughs> matches between RVD and Sabu where they'd just wail on each other with chairs and barbed wire, and, and that's where you see the people really sacrificing their bodies. Here, it, it was all just played up for laughs. You see it... You know, when you saw, what was it, New Jack come out after the 3D match? Well, New Jack always came down and kind of danced around and beat people up. But well, no, least... but, I mean, they beat up Team 3D, and then, like, three seconds later, they're up and hugging. Yeah, them. they're up and hugging. I mean, I, I and that, that's what's kind of going into this. People are saying, like, you should lay off. This is just a reunion show. They're meant to hug it out. I don't know. I just don't remember it being this sappy. 
and you know they've they've turned a hardcore wrestling into a sappy sentiment and i ugh, it just makes me wretch and the, the whole show made me wretch but i think we've dwelled on this long enough uh, i found it depressing but as for the whole effing show you know uh, for everyone who says that i don't like anything and i go into impact with a bad attitude i came into this with a bad attitude and i'll tell you right now this was probably the best TNA Impact show they've ever done. By quite a lot. Yeah, a well, straight up Impact show, sure. I, I'd say even in terms of like pay-per-view quality matches. Well, mm-hmm. granted, I haven't seen many pay-per-views, but I mean, I, I'm sure there's some that... And, you know, but... well, there's a very simple reason for that. It's simply for the fact they had a, they had a lineup of great matches, they shut the fuck up, and they let these guys get in the ring and do what they do best... And it worked. Oh my god! The very simplest of wrestling formulas worked! When they shut the fuck up, they stopped doing these gimmicks where they talk about WCW politics, they stopped talking about, like, shadow cabinets behind the the TNA championship committee, they stopped talking about ranking systems, they stopped talking about mystery opponents and shit like that. It was just... Simple. They had two guys who didn't like each other in the wrestling ring. They fought. There was a winner, and that was it. You know, and it it, it happened to be the blow off thing for a lot of different. Views. Now there was stupid shit took place in this show. Don't get me wrong, but it, it was far outweighed by the excellent wrestling that took place here. The first match being Kurt Angle versus AJ Styles because Kurt Angle's climbing the ladder, so to speak. Another, and again, once you stop to think about this particular angle, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because people are, like, moving above Kurt all the time. Like, what was it, uh, Matt Moore, uh, Hernandez got, like, leaped over him. But um, my main question for this one was, why wasn't AJ defending the television title? Because Kurt has to win. Because Yeah, because Kurt has to win, and if you gave him a belt, that would just be wrong. I, they, they, they kinda, that was an example of them painting themselves into a corner with this top ten ranking system. Because if he won, he'd have to carry the, the TV title, and then uh, when he wins the, the he, last one, he'd win the, the heavyweight championship, and he'd have two titles, and he'd be playing to retirement. Yeah, when he's when he's when he finally gets to the the heavyweight championship, he's got the TV title because he can't lose it until then, and so then it would be like title for title, and he'd be a double champ, and they'd be like, we can't do that. <laughs> so yeah, um, AJ's got this new weird tattoo under his arm. Did you see that? Yeah, the enormous AJ. AJ, and I think they said it was the dates of his children's children's. Birth. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, I either thought it was that or like the dates he won the TNA championship. I, and although I think only think he won it one time. <laughs> um, yeah, I was like, I, I'm not a big fan of ink, especially not when you tattoo your own name on your body. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I I don't have any any ink. Obviously, I'm not I'm not punk like that. I, I don't have a problem with tattoos, but it's like you said. <laughs> I never got that, and I've never heard. I thought of maybe he might like tattoo TNA, like or I, 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 I keep thinking he should tattoo like Ric Flair's face, <laughs> like going woo, because <laughs> every time, like you know, every time you'd get out of the shower, you'd raise your arm and be like woo. <laughs> I, I would, or just maybe, like maybe going full out, just do a whole belt around your tattoo waist. the championship belt around I'm the your... champion forever Rick bitches Rick Rude kind of uh, <laughs> uh, ravishing Rick Rude kind of did that where he had these these like flesh colored pants where he had like the belt airbrushed <laughs> uh, it was really disturbing to watch because he had like because it, it, it was flesh colored yeah it was all flesh colored it looked like rude. the belt was covering up his <laughs> schlong yeah so he had this thing um the other thing this was a really good match of course it's going to be a really good match, because you got AJ and Kurt Angle, two of the best guys in the company, just locking it up for like eight, nine minutes. Really good. I think my main complaint, if I had one about this match, is that AJ Styles does not have any idea how to wrestle as a bad guy. He, like, when he, seriously, if I were to tell you, if you were to watch this match, I took it completely out of context, and I plugged this match in, and I said, AJ's a good guy. You'd be like, alright. And if I said, okay, now here's a match where he's a bad guy, see if you can spot the difference. Aside from, like, one moment where he, like, pokes a guy in the eye, you'd never know. Except for the very ending in this match when he goes for a low blow. Kurt Angle catches him in the ankle lock and he taps out. But, like, aside from that, he's still doing the Pele. He's still doing the huge planches over the top rope. He's doing, um... Well, before, even before Flair 
it was just a matter of when you'd have a manager or not. You'd have someone uh, talking for him. Because I remember when AJ was first a heel, I want to say... I want to say, like, Russo was coming out with him or mm-mm, something mm-mm. like that. He had a heel manager with him. It was probably... I don't remember the... Uh, did he have a manager? Yeah. It was when he first was winning the, the TNA championship. Mm. He was being... I don't think they ever had Russo on TV. Well, whatever. It's been a while. But yeah, I, yeah. But anyway. That seemed to be the only difference, though, is you'd have a manager when he was being healed because he needs someone to talk for him. The next match, and this is when I... This is at the... They always put this match in the same spot. And it's always now about ten minutes in where I'm feeling pretty good after the curtain-jerking match. And then this happens. And I look at the remote. And I go... I could change the channel right now. The TNA Knockouts title match. Pirate Hooker versus Madison Rain. You remember? Okay. Which one shows her ass? They both know. show their ass. That's what kills me about this thing. They do this thing. Like, every woman in TNA does the exact same thing when they get in the ring now. Except, like, Hamada doesn't do this. They do this thing. You know how, like, Stacey Keebler would get in the ring, and she'd, like, they straddle the middle rope, and they, like, they they puff their ass. Yeah, you like this? Yeah, you like that? Come on. Um, they stick their ass out, and they, like, start humping the rope. They're like, mmm, yeah, middle rope. Mmm, that's what I like. You like that middle rope? And the people are like, she's got an ass! Yay! Ass! So but there's one that's specifically, like, you see so much of her ass... Like, when she yeah, yeah. comes out, yeah, that, you see her ass, and she might as well be walking backwards. Yeah, yeah. Because we don't want to see her face, and then she bends over and gropes the, the so, rope with her ass so again. So, Pirate Hooker does this thing where she, like, she straddles the rope and she humps the rope. And then, the beautiful people have this thing where when the beautiful people come out, they do it twice. The beautiful people, when they get, they come out on the ramp, they go, they kind of pose at the top of the ramp, then they turn around, and then they go, mmm, mmm. And then they come down, and then they hump the rope, and they do that. And so Madison Rain has these things where she's wearing, like, really, really high-riding shorts. So when she bends over, Taz always goes, Time to let the pigeons loose! Because her fucking ass is just, like, just pouring out from her shorts, right? So Madison Rain gets on the middle rope, and she starts humping the rope, and her ass is all over the place. And Angelina Love, pirate hooker, just, just is looking at her like, What a fucking whore. Who the fuck would do something that slutty? <laughs> and I'm like they all do this. I don't believe it. Like, it's what 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 also killed me was the beautiful people. Every time they would get in the ring, they they used to do this when they were still a unit. They would always like imply a lesbian kiss. Like they would all like lean in, and then they'd be like, "No, no, not this week." Like as if somebody at home is watching at home, going, "They're gonna do it. They're gonna do it. They're finally gonna." Damn it! <laughs> Do none of you know anything about TV and what they can show or what they can't show? Dad, I thought this week was going to be the time! That and, that and titties. Like, they keep trying to tease titties on a, a normal TV Fuck! show. What, Fuck you what mean is... we, we can't see it on network TV? <laughs> oh, and... Uh... Angelina, actually, Angelina does even something sluttier when she's humping the rope. She does this, I, I, I gotta do this again, I'm sorry, look away. She does this thing where she humps the rope, she's doing the thing where she's like, she's like, getting off on the rope, and then she points at her ass. She's like, fuck me here. Right here. I like it in my ass. Like, <laughs> she does this thing. And so, like, then Madison Rain actually does a somewhat tamer version of this, and she's like, you fucking whore. I don't know. Um, so, they have a really bad match, as normal. Motorcycle chick shows up, okay? And immediately as soon as the motorcycle chick shows up, the Everyone crowd starts to chant, Tara, Tara, Tara! And, like, Tara. the announcers go, I don't know who that could be. Do you, Mike? <laughs> and Mike's like, I don't know. But we know it's definitely a woman. They've been arguing about whether or not this could possibly be a man for, like, a month. Got a great rack. I yeah, don't Taz is like Taz is like she's got boobs, but you know that doesn't mean nothing in this day and age. And I'm like, well, mean he's got a great set of knockers. I don't. <laughs> I guess, but they're like Mike Tanay's like I think it's pretty conclusively a woman. Taz and Taz is like I don't know. <laughs> you 
You you grow up in the Red Hook, you see some weird stuff, man. <laughs> Paul London has some childbearing hips. <laughs> I've seen things you people wouldn't believe, Mike. So, Velvet Sky runs up and immediately kills the motorcycle chick with a chair, pulls her helmet off, and she's got another yeah, mask on mask. underneath the helmet. She can't see shit. <laughs> uh... Yeah, they, they another black mask, the chick runs away, Angelina wins with a downward spiral. I don't care. I've never cared. Any one of these chicks should just be they like... They still won, though, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, Velvet Sky cut off the interference. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this Seriously, this is what happens when you center an entire championship feud around a mystery that is in no way any kind of mystery. The crowd knows who this is. Everyone fucking knows who this is. It's not gonna be a... I, I know they're finally gonna whip this mask off the motorcycle chick, and the announcer's gonna be like, what the fuck? It's Tara! What the fuck? The when did this happen? And the crowd's gonna be like, seen it. You know, just... Because I'll be like that. Um, Triple threat. Mr. Anderson versus Matt Morgan versus the Pope. Kind of strange psychology here in that the bad guy is getting double teamed by the two good guys. Well, I instantly uh, was taken out when we saw Anderson get an entrance, but not Pope or Morgan. Yeah, they got jobber entrances. That was a little weird. They got the jobber entrance, so I knew that, that Anderson was going to... Well, you that, thought... That was, it, I thought that he was going to be the focus. I mean, he's he's the... He was the only person getting an entrance, so he's going over the other two guys. Well, that's weird. I actually thought that was kind of weird, because Pope is a really great entrance. I, I thought maybe they like just picked for time, they picked the guy with the best entrance, but I love Pope's entrance when he's got the money. And Pope makes it rain. He does make it rain. So, they did. Well, this was another okay match. It was actually really short. Yeah, that's my problem with um, it, because it was, it was okay, but I mean, it, it was just that, it was short. And so what they did was, they did this bit that was funny at first, and then they just kicked it, and they kicked it, and they did this thing where they throw Matt Morgan, um, sorry, they, they double-team Morgan, and Pope tries to pin him. Anderson pulls the Pope off and goes to the pin. Then Pope pulls Anderson off and goes to the pin. Then it was the fourth time. And then Anderson pulls time, the Pope off and goes for a pin. And then Pope pulls Anderson off and goes to the pin. And again... And again, and again, and again, and again, and then finally they stood up and like, are you going to fucking stop this? Like, they did this shit like seven times. Twice. One guy pulls the other guy off, another guy pulls the other guy off. The bit's over. Okay? Point made. They, they, fuck, they spent like a minute on this shit where they're like, one, two, yep, one, two, yep. And they just, I couldn't fucking believe how they... They thought this was a good idea. At like, a certain point, Morgan should have just been like, you guys fight it out, I'll just be laying here. He did, he <laughs> did. They threw Matt Morgan out, and he just kind of sat there. He's like, okay, have fun, guys. <laughs> the, the, he, he literally he di literally did what you're talking about. He They threw him outside. No, I mean, during the pinfalls, when they're just doing it again and again, I just would have been like, you guys fight it out. Uh. And you know, if the, if honestly, they probably should. If they were gonna go, the, if, if they were gonna do that, they probably should have gone the full nine and just done it like forty times. Like I'm not kidding. Just done like five minutes of them pulling each other out. Like just, Matt Morgan is laying there, like because it would have been like a Family Guy bit where they just kind of they kill a joke, then they beat the joke into paste, and then they kill it some more. That should have like if, if they were gonna do that like. Five minutes of this shit, because by then it would have just been like self parody. But they throw Morgan out, and he's just like the the Pope and Anderson kind of turn on each other, and Morgan's like he he basically all he all but sets up like a drink umbrella and calls for the waitress, and he's like, okay, you guys have fun. And so Anderson hits the mic check, Matt Morgan runs in, steals the pin, and what was resolved again? I don't know. It was okay. I Are guess. they feuding over something? No, Are Matt they Morgan's going not for a championship. Well, the thing is, Matt Morgan's not even ranked, and Pope and I think Pope and Anderson both are. So they're like tonight was like, well, it looks like Matt Morgan's gonna be back on the rankings. And I, for all that that matters, whoopty shit. Uh, Jeff Hardy Invitational. Shannon Moore comes out and answers the challenge. He says he wants a chance to prove that he belongs on the same pedestal as the best in the world. This was a pretty good match. This was a really good match. 
slow starting. It's slow. Uh, I it thought it was. It took okay. a while for for Shannon to get steam up, and you could tell because the crowd wasn't really into it. Yeah, the, kind of that's that's, that's part of the problem. Shannon. Yeah, that's part of the problem when you've got a you've got a roster full of old guys. They're pushing over the young guys, and they don't really believe Shannon Moore's can hang. That that's that was kind of the point was to prove that Shannon Moore could hang with Jeff Hardy, but it was a hard sell. People weren't buying it though. I mean, after this week, you're not going to see Shannon in any kind of championship match or anything that's going to matter. It's kind of like every other failed push in TNA where they'll chuck a win at someone and then the next week they're buried again. I don't he, know. You're, Shannon's you're going to keep going to Ink Ink and they're going to have their tag team championship reign, but he's not going to go off on his own and do a singles. You're very match. pessimistic about this Shannon Morph push. <laughs> Well, he's, he's tag team champion now. I just see him doing the tag team no, he's thing. Not, he's not champion. It's, it's a motorcycle machine. Oh, right. But, I mean, he's doing Ink Ink, so he's going to be doing that for a while unless he's going to be breaking up with... I don't know. I didn't see Jesse Neal anywhere in this show. Oh, well. Uh, yeah, I think the worst part about this one was the crowd was a hard sell. It's, it's going to be hard. Shannon Moore is not exactly the kind of guy who looks like a superstar. If it, I think that's kind of his problem is that... I think a lot of people consider him kind of be to be the the diet version of Jeff Hardy. <laughs> yeah, just just right. one calorie, not quite extreme <laughs> enough. Um, Motor City Machine Guns versus Beer Money, best two out of three falls. I missed this one, so I I can't talk about it. There's really not that much to say. It's it's kind of funny. Um, this was yeah, this was an excellent match. A, a lot. Of, I think the crowd. I, I keep saying this. The TNA crowd is the easiest crowd in the world. So, like, before the match is even starting, they're chanting, like, match of the year, and, like, this is wrestling. And, uh, honest to God, they're so easy. But this was an awesome match. This was really good. I, I uh, honestly, uh, Tanae was actually going overboard and describing this as, like, not only the best tag team feud in wrestling history. He was describing it as, like, the best series in sports, period. Like, he was... He was chalking it up to Yankees, Red Sox, Texas, Oklahoma. Like he, like he was like, it's better than any of them. This is the best wrestling series ever. And I'm like, I don't know, Mike. No. <laughs> and I, I, what honestly I think costs this series more than anything is the fact that every single match had to have some kind of gimmick to it, and almost every single match in the series had some kind of screw job finish that involved like a beer bottle or. D ref bumps or double ref bumps, like you know, two, like you had you had the Hebners getting knocked out in like two straight matches. And I I think when you have a, a lot of this kind of screw job finishes, when you have a lot of, I I am not a big fan of constant gimmick matches, and TNA is all about that. If there's a chance to throw a gimmick in a match, they will do it, like every single time. So I thought it was just kind of funny that you know the the resolution to the series is the best two out of three falls match. And and yet the nobody ever really took advantage of this thing where if you won the last match you get to choose the stipulations for the match afterwards. Like nobody was like, oh, beer money's handcuffed match or something like that, or like Motor City Machine Guns get tasers, or you know, we Motor City Machine Guns get hand grenades or something like that, <laughs> or beer money has to traverse this landmine field and. I don't know. It was, it was. This was a really good match, and of course, it went to the three falls. There's, they were never going to do this in two falls. Um, my favorite part, my favorite spot in this match was um, they were beating up Shelly, and Saban managed to regain the advantage with a jumping bomb angel double stomp, as Matt Stryker would call it. Huge jumping bomb angel double stomp. Good call, Matt Stryker. <laughs> He's not even on this show, and I'm busting his balls. Ah, I love it. Then the big one, RVD versus Jan. I'm uh, sorry, R RVD versus Jan. RVD versus Abyss for the uh, TNA World Heavyweight Championship. Stairway to Janice match. Eric Bischoff, special guest referee. The gimmicks just keep on coming. Should have been on a pole. Should have been on a pole. They missed a prime opportunity for it to be on a pole. That's what it's all about, having a weapon on a pole. Um, I think my favorite part of this match was uh, Abyss comes out first, and he immediately starts trying to climb the ladder before Rob even comes out. 
I thought that was funny. I thought, like, the, Rob does this thing where it's like, Rob Van Dam! Do, 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 do. And so he comes out, he's like, ah, right, Rob Van Dam! And he's like, oh shit! And he starts running down, the, he runs down to the ring and he like, he's like, no! And he pushes the ladder over and this is like, ah! <laughs> I got a kick out of that. It was me. Um, I said it was a cool idea. They keep cutting back to Dixie in the audience as if she had some kind of personal political stake in the outcome of this wrestling match. I never got why they keep doing... Like, every time Rob Van Dam comes out during the Sabu match, during the match before that on TV, they keep going like... They keep cutting Let me see if I can do a Dixie impression. <laughs> she was... She was doing... Yeah... The, she kind of has... I, I'm actually kind of picking up on subtle degrees of her expression. I may have unfairly chalked up her expression to being just one single expression, because there is some kind of animation, like right here. Like, you can tell when she's kind of amused. She kind of has this... She has an amused face, where... You know what I was talking like when I was doing the face before? When she's like... That's kind of her amused face. It's too much life. A little too much. I, I, I gotta work. I, I, I can't actually kill that much soul inside of me to get that robot stare. She may very well be an android from the future. He's, wor he's working on it. He's got a little bit too much twitch in his lips, but. Abyss actually has some kind of like a happy expression, which is the one I showed you where it was kind of. And then during this match, she had a concerned expression. Where her mouth was just kind of turned down a bit. Where she's, she kind of, I, I don't know if it's her expression that changes, but she shakes her head. Where she's like, I, I, I. <laughs> it's, she shakes her head. If she doesn't approve of what's going on, that's her concern look. Is she, she loads up her concerned program 1.1 beta and her head kind of like <laughs> and so like I for, I lost count of how many times they cut to Dixie in this match because like whenever Rob was getting beat up by Abyss they'd be like and Dixie Carter's just pacing like a caged beast <laughs> and they I keep think, doing this. I think people have been spoiled by having people who aren't actors but can play good management roles like Vince He's, he's never been an actor, he's never been a wrestler, but he's a good personality. And Derek Bischoff, I will say he's a good personality despite never having worked as an actor, never having worked as a wrestler. He knows how to say something in front of people and have people buy it. And now people think, oh, Dixie, she's president of TNA. I'm sure she's, she... She's pretty. I'm sure people will buy her as a as a credible person in this role. <laughs> and and, and I, I think people are going to think I'm picking on Dixie when I say... I do pick on Dixie a lot, but... She has no business being in front of a camera. Some people are just not good in front... Like, she has no expressions. She is a robot. I'm sure, like, if you talk to her backstage... Like, I think the most animate I ever saw her is when she got mad at the road agents when ECW first came and she was yelling at them. She's like, You don't need to know what's happening in this business, Al! It was like, she she actually loaded up a shouting program. I don't know, it was weird. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it was... It, I, I know I'm harping on this, but they were fucking harping on it. Every 30 seconds, they would cut back to fucking Dixie in the audience. Like... Dixie's still concerned about Rob's welfare. I, I can't. You, you have to see it. Like, I can't. Like, you'll see. This is what happened. This, seriously, this is what happens in the match. This is a again. This was a really good match. And like I've said that for every single match, this was a good match. And again, when they shut up and do this, that's fine. So, and but there was this was the dumbest match in the in the this was probably the worst match on the on the card. And the, I'm I'm saying that even though that was a really good match, it was still the worst match on the card, except for maybe the triple threat, just because it was so short. Put it over the triple threat, easy. You put it over the triple. Like, it was yeah, probably this was probably the second worst match, even though. Just because there was a lot of stupid stuff that took place in this match, they got these guys busted their asses. 
But there was weird psychology at work in this match. And it all started when Abyss goes under the ring and he gets his bag of thumbtacks. Which means he's getting hit with it. Yeah, which <laughs> I, I don't think... I don't think and that's not always the case. I'm I sure almost always is I'm the sure case. There's, there's like two times where he's actually able to hit someone with a thumbtack, but for the most part, it's a pretty good prediction or gamble when you say he pulls out I think the thumbtack. I think AJ's gone into the tax like one time, or Sting. I think Sting's been hit with the tax. Most tack. of the time, if you were putting money on it, it would be a pretty safe bet. And I think Sting was wearing his leather coat when he went into the tax, so it so yeah. didn't hurt. <laughs> um, so... Abyss goes to the goes under the ring and he gets his bag of thumbtacks and he's like, I got my bag of fucking thumbtacks and he starts dumping the tacks out in the corner and he's like, I got there's fuck there's fucking more in here and he starts dumping out his fucking broken glass in there and he's like, Look at this shit. I'm gonna fucking kill Rob Van Dam on these fucking tacks. And so, like, he he's gonna choke slam Rob and Rob fights out and it's one of those spots where like who's gonna go into the thumbtacks? It's Abyss. <laughs> And so they finally do this thing where, like, somehow they get into the turnbuckle, and he's gonna superplex Rob on the thumbtacks, and then Rob flips over the top, goes for a sunset flip, and power bombs the Jesus out of Abyss on the fucking glass and thumbtacks. And Abyss is like, ah! And so there's this moment where we're like, holy shit, that was cool! And then Rob gets to his feet, Abyss gets to his feet, and Abyss kicks his ass. Ten seconds later, it had it had to be at most ten seconds, and I almost I almost want to go back and watch it again because I may not be certain, but I think Abyss beat Rob to his feet. If it was not, it was a close tie. This is the same time, roughly. It was like like Rob gets to his feet, Abyss gets to it, and they're just like, hada, 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 and they start fighting, and then like Abyss kicks him in the gut, throws him down, and then he goes outside the ring again. Well, hang on, I wrote it down. Um, yeah, he goes outside the ring after beating Rob up, after getting power bombed on broken glass, and he goes under the ring and he gets a board with barbed the with wire. the barbed wire stapled to it. The, the the thing they always have under the ring with the barbed wire stapled to it. So he pulls the board out and he throws it in the ring. And my question is, how the fuck is that going to hurt any worse than being power bombed on broken glass and thumbtacks and thumbtacks? Barbed wire? That's a step down. <laughs> There's actually more pointy things in the tax than there are. There's the way more pointy wire. things in the tax than broken glass. And so they they fight and they fight and I uh, Abyss uh, like Rob finally gets hit with the boar or something like that and Abyss finally gets Janice. And now that Abyss has this ultimate yeah uh, uh, Rob Van Dam's on the outside. Uh, they throw he throws Rob Van Dam on the outside. Abyss gets Janice. And now that Abyss has the ultimate weapon, we have to see what Dixie thinks. Dixie's worried. So, he comes down, he climbs down with the ladder, he's about to hit Rob. Let's see what Dixie thinks. Still worried. And so, he's got this, he got the, Janice is the board with the nails in it. So he's, he's got this board, he sees Rob on the outside, and he's like, hang on a second. Puts the board down. He puts it down and goes outside the ring. He picks Rob up, throws him in the ring, goes in the ring, picks up the board. And then he's like, I'm going to hit Rob with this board now. Why couldn't he take the board, go out the ring, where Rob is like on his face outside the ring and shove the board up his ass. Am I completely stupid? So, Rob retreats to the corner. He's all slumped. He's like, oh, Jesus, fuck. He's going to hit me with the board. And Abyss is like, I'm going to hit this guy with a fucking board. So, Abyss, he does this thing where he's like, he runs all the way across the side of the ring and he raises the board over his head. And he's like, ah! And he starts charging across the ring and Rob's like, no! And he ducks. Because, duh. You know? Um, so, Abyss, he swings the ah! He hits the turnbuckle. Now, I'm pretty sure the thing was supposed to stick in the turnbuckle. He actually had to stick it in. Yeah, because it didn't stick. He hits the turnbuckle and it like... It 
bounces. It boing. <laughs> and so Abyss, he's like He's trying to grate it. He's like he's like through. He's like ha ah, 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 ah. Now it's stuck. Ah, 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 ah. And you can see the board moving around and he's like hey, hey, ah <laughs> I can't pull it out of this foam pad Impossible Ah <laughs> The board and by this time, Rob's gone outside to get a chair. He hits Abyss in the back of the chair. Uh, he sets him up in the corner. Sets him up in the corner, puts the barbed wire board against him in the corner, and he's looking for the coast to coast uh, Van Terminator. And then he's like, "Wait, I can make this hurt more." So he grabs the chair. There's a chair. <laughs> And he grabs it. He grabs the. He, he climbs the other post, and he's like, "I'm gonna." Because you know how Rob always does this thing where he like is like, "I'm gonna kick this fucking guy in the head." Like, I'm gonna jump across this fucking ring and do this because I'm Rob. And, and so, so like Rob, he's very illustrative. That's why I like about Rob. He's like, he. There's no doubt about what he's going for next because he'll fucking do it. Like if he's gonna do that thing where he uh, he does the spinning leg drop on the guy in the guardrail, he'll like mime it out. He'll be on the apron, and he'll be like, I'm going to do the thing and drop it. And he's like, because I'm Rob. And cause then he'll, he'll, like, that's the end of sentence. He'll be like, Rob, man, yeah. So he gets on the turnbuckle, and he's like, I'm going to do the thing where I'm like, ugh. And then Abyss is like, no, can't move. <laughs> so he takes the chair, and he does the Van Terminator across the ring, and he kicks the chair into, into the, the board, board, and the board with the barbed wire hits Abyss. And... That fucking death blow. <laughs> wouldn't that wouldn't that make it hurt less? I don't know, but <laughs> I don't know. But I, my question was: he goes for the five star frog splash and hits. But my question is: would it have been enough had he not drop kicked the chair into the board? <laughs> I I ask you, sir. <laughs> Especially after power bombing him through tax and glass. No, that didn't hurt. He's like. I need more. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah he, he needed to. He needed to up the ante. He needed to make it hurt if more. If I could somehow work in a trash can. <laughs> yeah, he could have stacked a trash can. Put the trash can, and then put the board, lean it against. Yeah, it. Yeah, you know what he could have done is he could have put a trash can and then um, stacked up the ladder in front of the trash can as and a then, triangle. Yeah, and then drop kick the chair into the ladder into the trash can the board of the barbed wire into abyss and that would have fucking just murdered it's a multiplier effect it, it yeah it multiplies up. it's like it's like when you do the rolling thunder like you put a guy on a ladder and then you put a chair on him and then you rolling thunder which i think they did that that hurts way worse totally that hurts way worse than anything oh yeah so f rob wins the match hulk hogan comes out and Hulk Hogan proceeds to stick his head firmly up Dixie Carter's ass and lick the inside of her colon clean. Say like, and I, I can't even remember. He's like, he's like, raise the bar, brother. He's like, hardcore justice, Rob Van Dam's the hood ornament, brother. Uh, uh, hardcore wrestling's the way it is, brother. Uh, uh, what, what the fuck was I talking about, brother? Oh, you're the hood ornament, brother. And, and I got this big surprise for you, brother. He's like, uh, the ECW guys who were at Hardcore Justice and they raised the bar, brother. They're going to come out and they're going to celebrate with you, dude. And so, like, the ECW guys come out and he's like, brother, 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 you know, I'm going to leave this ring and let you guys celebrate your really oldness, brother. Because we're old, too. And, like, then Tommy Dreamer comes out and, of course, he has to stick his head up, up Dixie Carter's ass. And Dixie Carter's smiling. So that's why I said she had kind of has, her, her mouth moves. She, she mouth acts. She's... She's kind of like, not, the, the, there's no soul in these eyes. Like, no animation here at all. She, like, it's like watching the Terminator try to smile, where she's like, <laughs> and so they like, Tommy Dreamer proceeds to kiss Raven, uh, not to kiss Raven's ass, kiss Dixie's ass. Lights go out, and Tanae's like, Tanae actually says in the same voice. An eight-year-old boy would say, hearing an ice cream truck, Oh boy! This must mean the Sandman's coming! He was so happy. Mike Tanay was. He's like, you know what this means? It's the Sandman! Yay! 
<laughs> and then I they thought come... it might meant Sting or Gangrel or, or yeah, Undertaker anyone else. Sabu. Anyone I guess that... Sabu was in the ring. <laughs> anyone else that uses darkness to get inside the ring. But Mike today, he was so happy. He was like, it was the Sandman's coming. <laughs> And it wasn't the Sandman. No, uh, Mick Foley's down, and all of a sudden... He got a phantom wound. I don't know how that happened. You didn't hear a chair. Foley? Yeah, he was just down, clutching his head, and there was no one around him, and no one, you didn't hear, like, a chair shot or anything like that. He just got struck by a case of... Heart punch. Oh. Yeah. So, Fortune's in the ring, and they start beating up the entire ECW roster. And I mean kicking their ass. It's like, Beer Money's got hockey sticks... I don't know. Um, they start they start cleaning house. Like uh, the, the Fortune guys are just killing everybody. Raven comes down, gets the shit kicked out of him. Then they then they cut to the Sandman. <laughs> I love the Sandman here cuz Sandman's in the audience. Sandman sees the stuff going on in the ring. It's like World War 3 in that fucking ring. There's guys getting killed. There's guys getting maimed. Like James Storm is fucking choking a guy with a hockey stick. Uh, what's the other guy? Uh, uh, Robert Roode has, like, Tony Mamaluke in the glass. corner. Who's got, like, a shard of glass. He's like, ah! And Tony Mamaluke's, like, bleeding all over. He's like, holy shit! And, like, Sandman, he's so impacted by the sight of his friends getting outright butchered, he does this. And he starts waddling to the ring through the, through the audience. He's like, he's in no particular hurry. See, but I don't think that would change. And like I was saying in ECW, I still think he would have went through the entire Inner Sandman, yeah, you think, you strolling think, around the ring until the song was done, and then finally think, get in the ring. Even in the one. days, even in the days of ECW, <laughs> when there was a WWF invasion, like when Jerry Lawler was leading an invasion to ECW, and like the WWF guys were beating up all the ECW guys, and then all of a sudden Inner Sandman hits. And Sandman appears. Yeah, a, Sandman appears. That actually may have happened. <laughs> I need to go back and see that during the Jerry Lawler invasion days. If, like, enter Sandman hits and Sandman is, like, smoking a cigarette, he's got a beard, he's like, oh! And then, like, four minutes of enter Sandman pass, he circles the ring twice, drinking his beer, and, like, finally he's like, I will wrestle now. And he climbs <laughs> in the ring and he starts whacking people with his stick. No, Sandman, no particular hurry to get in the ring. None. He he shambles over, he, he waddles over to the guardrail, he looks at the guardrail and goes, you can see this expression across his face like, oh man. So Hope I don't tear something going over He swings guardrail. his leg over the guardrail, he's like, who, ha, ha, and he climbs <laughs> over the guardrail. <laughs> and then, these guys are still getting butchered in the ring, like Tony Mamaluke is getting fucking destroyed. Guido's in there, he's getting the shit kicked out of him. He starts to climb the stairs, and then he turns around, and he poses. He's like, "Ah, oh, I'm the Sandman! And he turns around, and sure enough, some motherfucker hits him in the back with a cookie sheet. And he's like, ah, oh, and he falls down. And I'm like, you know, Sandman, that seemed entirely avoidable. <laughs> he's like, there's these guys who are just kicking the shit out of his friends. And he's like, hang on a second, guys. Sandman! <laughs> and they beat the shit out of the Sandman and I'm like you're a fucking idiot then they cut backstage for the last shot of the show and Rob Van Dam is like covered in evil dead amounts of blood he's been fucking murdered okay like and and like seriously like evil dead amounts of blood like the dude is like he's laying in a pool of blood like Somebody took a bucket of fucking caro syrup and, like, his, his suit's torn. He's all got the shit kicked out of him. And standing over him laughing like a child is Abyss. And he's got the board with nails in it. And this board is, like, dripping in gore. It literally has gore on it. Like, I think it even has, like, a piece of flesh. Yeah, there's, like, a piece of, there's like a piece of Rob <laughs> hanging off the fucking board with nails in it. And... I'm going like, are you serious with this shit? This is what I'm talking about. This, you know, I, I keep mentioning this every time we talk about a hardcore match. And basically every time we talk about Abyss is there's like this unspoken question that you ask whenever there's a no disqualification match and they go, anything goes, you can bring anything to the ring you want. And the question immediately is, why don't you bring a sword? Or my gun. Why don't you bring a shotgun? 
Abyss is like, he, he is not, this is not a good thing when you're raising this question, because it's one of those things where you suspend disbelief, and you just think, well, the wrestlers don't want to kill each other. They just want to beat each other up. So, like, there's kind of a, like, a restriction. Like, an unspoken restriction on what you bring to the ring. So, like, a chair. A chair could kill you. But if you just whack a guy over the head with a chair, you're like, oh, it knocks him out. Abyss brings a fucking board with, like, seven-inch nails in it. And he's like, I'm gonna hit you with this. I always took it to be whatever was... Whatever was around, whatever it's part of the wrestling. Business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People like, sit on people sit on folding chairs. That's why people hit other people with folding chairs. It's available, or monitors, or choke choke people with cords, or you know ladders are used in matches now. So ladders are underneath the ring. Those kind of things. I mean, that's why they're used in hardcore matches. They're around. There's stuff you can grab and use to hit people with. But when you start. Like you said, straining disbelief. It's like, okay. Oh, it goes beyond I, disbelief. Why don't I, I bring a gun? I could it goes shoot. beyond disbelief because we've reached that point. Like, what if Abyss just fucking killed him? Like, took a board with nails in it and hit him in the skull with it so hard it killed him. That's not a question we should be asking on this show. This is what I'm talking about. Like, this, seriously is some stupid shit. You know, like you, I was... You, I, I, I told you what was good about the show. I'm telling you what's bad. This is stupid. Because you've got someone who's attempting to murder people. He is trying to kill Rob Van Dam. He basically has. Because the next show, I swear to God, Mike Tanay, they cut back to today, slightly before this happened, and he goes, but folks... This is not the end of the show. In fact, it's just getting started. Because we're here to announce that there's gonna, we're kicking off a third hour of TNA television programming. Reaction coming up right after this broadcast. And right, I'm just like, oh goody. A third hour? What I don't get about that is Spike TV is not only paying to put two hours of this god-awful programming on. And I know this was a good show, but trust me, this show was an aberration. This show, TNA is god awful programming. They've been paying to put this show on the on the air for years now, and now they're paying for a third hour. Th thank you, sir. Can I have another? So I tuned in to watch some reaction. I haven't watched all of it yet because it was fucking hilarious. This was actually really funny stuff because this is where they were put. They basically pushed. All of the, the interview segments, segments, all of the talkie segments, out of the show. They pushed it to this third hour. Now it's a reality show. So I wrote down some of the... They, they, they're kind of pretending like this is really real. So they have all these... Th like, they go back and they talk to Kurt Angle. And Kurt, they ask Kurt Angle, who do you think they is? Like, a bit when he talks about who they are. And he's like, honestly, I don't think they exist. I think... You know, Abyss is a really deranged dude. Uh, I, I, I think he just invented these guys. Even though we've established firmly by now it's Fortune. Like, even Mike Tanay says, we're pretty sure it's Fortune. So, uh, uh, Angle's like, well, you know, Abyss had a really weird upbringing. So, I think, you know, he's, he's invented these people and he worships them like gods. And then he says, Abyss is dangerous. He's insane. Maybe someone should do something about him. You think? Really? He's beaten Rob Van Dam into a vegetative state. Maybe someone should do something about him. Yeah, maybe Dixie Carter should do something about this homicidal maniac with a four-foot length of board with nails in it. You're fired. You're fired. You're suspended? I'm calling the cops. She suspended Sting for hitting Jeff Jarrett with a bat. Abyss has taken out the world champion, attempted murder, rendered him comatose. How much you want to bet next week Dixie Carter doesn't do shit? If, 100 to 1? Does anyone want to take that bet? I don't know. Um, so, Anderson, this was my favorite part. This is like 10 minutes in. 
Um, Anderson says, quote, This is getting goddamn ridiculous. Your <laughs> <laughs> words were never spoken. Ken. <laughs> I salute you, sir. This is getting goddamn ridiculous. One of those unexpected lines that... <laughs> <laughs> I may actually go back and watch the rest of Reaction if the rest of the show is anywhere near as funny as that. Well, Anderson's perfect. I love him. <laughs> this is getting goddamn ridiculous. It's like Taz. Taz doesn't care. He just utters out whatever. <laughs> That's all for this episode of Wrestle Wrestle. I'll be back. I don't know if you'll be back to talk about SummerSlam. We've been talking for a while. Um, but yeah, we'll be back with SummerSlam, uh, which was a much better show, at least in my opinion. Or not, actually, what am I talking about? I'm talking about Hardcore Justice. I'm sorry about that. Uh, this was not as good a show as the whole effing show, actually. You definitely agree with that. But we'll get to that. See you next time. <laughs>